Hi, all. My name is Devin Crane. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Breaking Equity. Uh, and with me today, I have Laurent Bruneau, um, the author of Algorithmic Short Selling with Python, available on Amazon, a well-known and well-renowned short seller. Laurent, thank you so much for joining me today. Good morning. Uh, sorry, good evening. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure. <laughs> not, not a problem. Uh, th thanks again. And, and just so you know, I'm, I'm just straight stealing inspiration from you on, uh, on my Zoom background with the $100 bill soon to match the, the what, I'm sorry, what is it? The trillion dollar bill of Zimbabwe? $100 trillion. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so appropriate for today's market environment. So it's a, so appropriate. Um, Laura, thank you. Thank you very much. I would love if, if you'd be able to just kind of start us off and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, how you got into algorithmic short selling. So um, good morning and good evening. Thank you very much again for having me here. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm, my name is Laurent Bernu. I'm uh, 51 years old. I live in Japan. I've been living here for over a quarter of a century. I'm originally from, uh, I was born in New Zealand and I grew up in New Caledonia. In Japanese, they call it Tengu Kunichiban Tsukashima, which is the closest island to paradise. I got on to the market uh, back in 2001. Prior to that, I was working an accountant as an accountant at a Japanese company, preparing the financial statements in Japanese. So for the people who say, oh, you don't understand fundamentals, wait, 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 wait. I used to write, I used to write financial statements to put wine on the table. So let's chill here. Um, wine on the table, wine on oh, the table. Yeah, people say food, food, food. No, not, well, f wine is food, right? <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Um, the, um, so uh, how I got into short selling. So I got into the market in 2001. In 2002, I moved to the hedge fund world. And then I went to two consecutive hedge fund world. In 2007, I went to Fidelity as a dedicated uh, short seller. My mandate there was to uh, underperform the worst bar, bear market in modern history. So do worse than this. I mean, that's one hell of a difficult job. Uh, but I originally I started doing fundamentals and more uh, quantitative. I did a bit of technical. And then I realized that the proper way to do short selling, I believe, is algorithmic. If investment is a process, then automation is the only logical conclusion. This is something that has stood the test of time since uh, the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. If anything is a process, then automation is the logical conclusion. Uh, it doesn't sit well with a lot of fundamental people. And um, so this is how I But you started. know fundamentals. Of course I do. Well, I, I, <laughs> I'm a CPA by trade. I've done <laughs> enough fundamentals. So it's funny, like a lot of people who criticize me, oh, you don't understand fundamentals. And then they would, in the same breath or after the meeting, they would come back. Excuse me, could you could you help me with uh, with those financial statements? Oh yeah, no problem. This is this rule. No problem. Here you go. Okay. <laughs> so anyhow, so uh, in 2015, then after that, I decided to um, to do a fundamental uh, to do an algorithmic uh, trading shop. It didn't pan out well because I didn't know how to program well. And uh, my vision back then is very much now what is happening, and uh, I believe it's inevitable and market participants are inexorably, inevitably going to gravitate toward uh, algorithmic trading, particularly with gamification and this, all this simplification. So yeah, I wrote a book, I wrote a course about short selling. Now, why short selling as opposed to oh, buy long and so on and so forth? Short selling is, uh, is, uh, is Terra Incognita. There have been more books and more resources devoted to new asset classes and tested strategies than the time honored uh, craft of uh, short selling. So my yeah, job, can, please. Yeah, can you can you explain like when I think of short selling, like I think that the company should be like the company valuation is basically going to go down, right? Right. And it's kind of, like in my mind, this oversimplification of it is, you know, you buy stock when it's it should go up, you short sell when the stock is going to go down, but it's not the same. All right, so here, here already two things. For, uh, short selling on, uh, so selling short on valuations. 
Now, interestingly enough, um, it doesn't work. Example, um, all the tech stocks, they had like surreal valuations. Let me give you an example. For instance, uh, my wife works at Twitter. Elon Musk uh, rocked up one day and said, well, we're going to buy you for, uh, the share price of 54.40. That's a price to sales of nine. Nine, nine price to sales. That ex so not even earnings, a price to sales of nine. So it would probably take somewhere between 127 to 180 years to make that money back. So this is completely surreal. Even if it halved, the share price would still be expensive. And it's not a statement about Twitter or anything. It's a statement about what's happening with valuations in general. It's, it's not a statement by any company in general. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that if the market decides that valuations don't matter, then they don't until one day they start doing so. So when valuations have escaped the gravity of reason, they can go all the way up to the stratosphere, past the ionosphere, and then one day they get shot down like a, like a cheap old Russian uh, satellite. And then they have a rude <laughs> encounter. <laughs> they have a is rude it, encounter. Isn't this the argument against Tesla all the time that the valuation is completely out of line with what other automakers are are doing and the valuations associated to them? Exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, Tesla is valued as a text. It's a car manufacturer valued as a tech stock whose bonds are uh, rated as near junk. Something's got to give, and and for that matter, like those share prices are still going up. So valuations in and of themselves on the, and the counter example to that is actually excellent shorts. This is what I write about in the book. The best shorts you can ever find are, are cheap. They are called value traps. So, and in uh, the classic uh, analyst literature, but it's, but it's, but valuations are so cheap. And then dun, 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 they continue to mow the loan. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> They, go, they continue to go into zombie land because there's a depreciation there and it's a long decay. So between the time they're shot in the ionosphere like a cheap Russian satellite all the way down to mowing the lawn, there's all this time where actually they're fantastic shorts. And the best part of them is a lot of them have high dividend yield. So people have this misconception and these blind spots about short selling. Oh, you got a short valuation or something that is super high. No, hit hit the high dividend yield because they're predictable and uh, hit the find the valuation traps, the value traps. So valuations don't really work. And uh, also another thing is I have a strong belief in, um, in symmetry. A lot of what, what is happening with a lot of market participants is that they have a whole set of uh, tools and a whole set of conditions to go long and a different set of conditions to go short. Now, the problem with this, it works until it doesn't work. So, and it's true because if you observe how stocks behave, stocks, they go up the escalator and they go down out the window. So <laughs> it's def definitely the last couple of days. It's like, it's like spy <laughs> just gave up. Oh uh, yeah. The market has, under, has entered an amber patch, meaning the market has taken a massive dump and it's not about to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh... Amber is one way to put it for a lot of investors lately. Yeah. So, but so, so the, the symmetry is using the same sort of conditions for both entry and exit or? Absolutely. Uh, okay. So this is where it gets interesting. So yes, using, sim using similar conditions for entry and exit. Now where people get tripped up is that, oh, short selling is the inverse of going long. Well, it isn't. The short selling world obeys its own laws and it has its own rules. So for instance, going long is the inverse of, of uh, selling short, but, the inverse, but, it, but selling short is not the inverse of going long. As in, if you survive the aridity of, a, of uh, the short selling world, then whatever you do on the long side is very likely to flourish. It reminds me of this book uh, called The Martian. In The Martian, uh, uh, Matt Damon was saying, oh, it is space. The environment does not cooperate. So the market is out there to kill you. And if you can survive the short selling world, then more likely than not, you're likely to flourish and likely to thrive on the long side. So why is it important? Why is symmetry important? <clears throat> is what happens is at some point, the rules that 
govern your long strategies and the rules that govern your short strategies are likely to conflict. And usually this happens at the, in, when you're in a drawdown, when actually things are not working that well. So what I do believe in is particularly for stocks, you were mentioning stocks, is I believe that rather than doing it in absolute, you, you're far better off doing it in relative. Now, let me elaborate on this. Example, S&P is a market cap weighted index. It's a market cap weighted benchmark. That means that mm -hmm. roughly 240 or 250 of them are, will be underperforming and 250 of them will be outperforming. When people short in absolute, when they show the, the, the price that they see on the screen, what happens is they take a bet on, on uh, timing the market top or timing the market bottom. When you're doing in absolute and relative, you're basically fighting the index. So you're doing something called sector rotation. At some point, right. you will be long high beta, and at some point, you will be short uh, low beta. So it's a beta arbitrage. It's also a sector arbitrage. Example, at the moment, defensive utilities, they are performing. Techs are getting creamed, uh, <laughs> cratering. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's true. It's true. It's true. Is, so, please. I'm, 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 kind of, I'm kind of wondering though, in, in terms of, you know, I, I definitely want to let you finish, but I'm, I'm wondering in how to frame this in terms of like an algorithmic, you know, automated fashion where you're focused on these, on these sector rotations. Because as I'm thinking about it, you know, with, with my background from, from AI and ML, you know, when you develop sorts of these sorts of rules, when you develop machine learning models, like they're restricted within these bounds and sometimes trying to identify how, how they work together can, be, can really be the secret of how you actually manage the model or how you build that, that, framework, that, that framework with the data behind it. That's an excellent question. So that's, that's an excellent question. So now you're, the, the concept that lies behind this is called regime. Is it bull? Is it bear? So all you have to do mm -hmm. is, so first things first, the, the, the data that you feed the, the model, instead of being the absolute price, it's relative. So it's the OHLC volume divided by the close of the benchmark. And then you will see that it will paint a completely different picture. Then the sec step two is define regime. What are the rules that, oh, beyond this point, I'm in bull. I'm in bull until I'm in bear. Or, be, or beneath this point, beneath this threshold, I'm in bear territory. So markets are basically, they're, they're simple, but complex. Okay, no, they, well, let, let me rewind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, uh, we, we're gonna get there, we're gonna get there. Markets well, yeah, yeah, I believe it, I believe it, we'll get there. Ma markets are complex. So there's they're complex systems, complicated system and simple systems. A simple, uh, a complex system, a complicated system is send people to Mars. That's complicated, mm -hmm. but it can be broken down into, all right, we need to build a, we need to build a spaceship. We need to have fuel. It can be broken down into simple system. A complex system is terraformation on Mars. There's no rule there. Right. So the market, the markets are complex, but the natural inclination is to solve complexity with complicated rules. Now, what, there's something called the gaze heuristics developed by the Max Planck Institute, which, means, which says that basically complex system can be solved or approximated with simple solutions. Example, if you see a fast projectile rebounding, that's clearly uh, rocket science, right? We can all agree yep. on that. I completely okay. agree. What, okay, now answer this. When was the last time you saw Serena Williams uh, solving the uh, second degree stochastic equation by the side of the court? <laughs> you don't see that, right? No, no, no. But I so know the, she's really good at this. She's good at this. She's good at intercepting the ball, sending it back. So simple system. So long-winded right. answer to answer your question. Relative series and then simple model to basically determine the regime. Is it bull, is it bear? And then you'll have a classification and then that's it. And within that, you, look, you can observe the sector rotation. Now, the beauty of the system compared to fundamental, when you do fundamental, 
you try to answer a question, why should it go down? Why should Tesla go down? And then, mm -hmm. wow, you have an infinite universe of possibilities. Not only that, you take a business risk because contained within this question, there's, the, there's a second question is, why should it go down now? You might be vindicated in, at mm -hmm. some point you will be vindicated. But as uh, John Maynard Case used to say, markets can stay rational much longer than you can stay solvent. Now, when you take this approach of trying to reclassify into a regime, you have, you're basically trying to answer three questions because you say, oh, you've noticed this is going bare. So you understand that the, the resulting, the result of this is going in bearish regime or bullish regime, whatever that is. So there are three questions. Is it, is it uh, sector specific where you see a group of uh, stocks belonging to the same sector starting to tank like tech at the moment? In which case, okay, fine, you have your answer. So pick one, doesn't matter. I mean, is, if it's as a group, is it uh, just market timing for the moment? Maybe it's taking a break. Like, okay, that thing is doing well. Now it's getting off the car. Take a leak, have a Coke, then get back on the car. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Right. No, or, no, it, no. or if you see other stock uh, performing and this one underperforming, then this is stock specific. Then the, then the question is, why is it this stock going down? Then this is the time when you can do fundamentals. So the approach that we have with algorithmic trading is in a way much more logical, much more efficient. It can cover a lot more ground. Does it make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. I'm actually thinking of this in, in, in like one of my most successful strategies that I've, I've constructed is, is using, like the way that I'm thinking of it is I'm, I, I've actually created this broad swath of different sectors to then screen for those, those sectors that have the highest probabilities for my entry criteria and exit criteria based upon the strategy that I'm using. So it, the way that I'm thinking of it is like, it makes total sense how you're, how you're applying, you know, simple solutions to complex problems and breaking it down in, into simpler pieces and really trying to identify this, this relative model to apply to these systems. Um, it's super interesting. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's just, I've never, I've never actually heard it. I've never heard it phrased that way, especially with algorithmic trading. I mean, um, and, and really related to short selling in the context of, you know, when I was first introduced to, to the market, if you will, it was always just like, Hey, just buy a share of Apple, buy a share of, you know, Amazon, but you've never really like put that system around it. And, and algorithmic trading is like, and developing these systems is like the exact opposite of, of just like this experience. Cause now you actually need to build these systems around these things and why you would short or, or, you know, why you may go long. Mm -mm -mm. And interesting enough, you just like let why you would short. Now, this is interesting. Like, why is short selling important? Why does it matter? What does it matter for a retail trader? Why does it matter for an in institutional? Now, in the back of the mind of every single market participant, we always have, you know, like when you wo watch Pulp Fiction, you saw Marcellus Wallace watch something here. And in the back of our mind, there's always like, but there's a bear market looming around the corner. I'm going to lose all my money. Don't you go to bed with that from time to time? <laughs> Especially these days, of course. But <laughs> yeah, so, these days. <laughs> right? So bear markets are happening. Bear markets, I mean, of course, at the moment, they're anti-patriotic, they're anti-constitutionals. But bear market, we all have this innate fear of like, oh, there's a tiger in the bush. And what kind of investor? Who would you be? Who would you be? This is an interesting question, actually. Who would you be if you were confident that you could make money in bull markets and bear markets alike? How would you size your positions? What kind of strategy would you be? What kind of person, human beings, would you be? So my job is, my mission is to restore the craft, to rehabilitate the craft. Because there's, being a short seller, it's not like a back, uh, back alley uh, bare knuckle kind of thing it's just a discipline <laughs> like any other thing like it's funny because when i go when i used to tell uh, 
companies I, I have this I have this funny story like I'm a short seller I remember like once going to a company I'm a short seller I believe you're a buy I'm not going out of this meeting room until you, um, you convince me that like until I understand why I should buy your company the guy in Japanese like he started to say this is going to be a long meeting fast forward we bought the convertible bond and we actually made 50% on that one then I, I called the guy like can I just take you for lunch oh okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but the idea there behind the short selling is I don't I don't think that going that if your business model is to run around and defame company then stop watching this meeting go to the dollar shop buy coffee mugs because los federales are about to establish base camp in your meeting room <laughs> I believe that short selling is a very noble discipline that's something that everybody should learn because it's going to make you stronger it's going to make you better and you, it's going to assuage the, the, the fear that we have that, oh, there's a bear market. Now, if you learn the tools and the skills, you can apply them on the long side and you can make money either way. Make sense? Yeah, totally. But from like, uh, I mean, it's, it's very interesting because at least in, from what I can see in my, in like my culture, like short selling is an innate negative. But from, you know, it's, it's like anti-American because it's anti-growth, but that, that's not what you're saying. It's actually, uh, you should embrace it because it is actually the fundamentals of growth and balance that you need to be able to handle both of these aspects. Absolutely. Um, make stronger, make stronger traders. You know what? I mean, if you, it's okay not to learn short selling, but the, you know, I mean, I'm, 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 can I use profanity? I, I want to quote the great American philosopher, Tony Soprano. <laughs> so t Tony There's Soprano- no hits. no hits allowed. No hits allowed. So <laughs> Tony Soprano, when his, uh, when his car was in his nephew, who came in the car, said, I want my money maker with your feelings. You know, when you go around, the, when you go, when you decide to, to tackle the bear market, when you decide to tackle the, mar the market and market has bull and bear regimes, if you only go long, it's like stepping into the ring against Mike Tyson with only your left, uh, your left jab. Good luck with that one. No, <laughs> that's no, the definition of an unfair fight, right? Yeah, that's, 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 not, that's not a fair fight to begin with. Uh, yeah. But going in with one hand just sounds terrible. So learn the skill. You might not use them. But if you apply them even to the long side, you'll be better. And the skills of short selling, they're not extraordinarily complicated. I mean, my belief is that short selling, the, what defines a good short seller is the ability to set stop loss and the ability to honor them. So it's really so, just an application of a discipline. That's an application of a discipline. On top of that, money is made in the money management discipline, in the money management module. So if we break it down very simply, and this is the, uh, the essence of the book, if you read the book, all I'm trying to do is work from a very simple formula called gain expectancy. That's it. Now, there are two types of strategies, one with positive skews, which are generally trend following, and one with negative skews, which are generally mean reversion. And what is mean reversion? Mean reversion is basically an arbitrage against time. So markets are inefficient. Yes, 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 yes. Markets are inefficient. They're inefficient. No, I, agree. I agree with that one completely. Exactly. Um, they're inefficient and ineffi those inefficiencies tend to correct. So they correct all the time and they get arbitraged away. So when they get arbitraged, this is uh, the essence of mean reversion. Like, oh, this something is going out of work. Let's bring, let's teach him some table manners and let's bring it back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Valuations totally are a bit rude. Wait, wait, wait. Let me teach you some table manners, boy. Come back here. And then trend following. If you don't know which strategies you are, chances are you're a trend follower. So basically, you buy Apple at 12 and you retire a, a, a multimillionaire, that kind of thing. So when, mm -hmm. oh, this is going up or this is going down, chances are you're a trend follower. This is what 80 to 90% of the people are. Uh, the mean reversion category is more, is more rare. So this is it. So this is the basis of the PNL distribution, right? It's very simple, it's gain expectancy. Now within that, the, form, the mathematical formula for that is how often you win uh, and how, how much do you win on average minus how often you lose and how often you lose on average, right? 
So within that, there's only one one verb, one uh, one variable. Stop loss has an influence on three of those four variables plus frequency of trading. So okay. stop loss basically tells you how often you're going to win and how often you're going to lose. Tight stop loss, you're going to lose a lot, but you're going to lose on average very small. So you're going to have a heavy has. That's the, sorry, that's the word, uh, that's the jargon. You're going to have a very uh, heavy uh, strategy. You're going to have very high cumulative losses. Mm -hmm. But if you have loose stop loss, you're going to have a higher win rate, but you're going to lose more on average. That's it. But average profit, you can't exactly determine those, except if you're doing mean reversion strategies. Now, mean reversion strategies, they make you sleep well because they're very nice equity curves. But the captain of the, but you have, you have really big losses. The captain of the Titanic at a 99.9% .9 win rate. <laughs> it's true laura so so I, I have a question for you like related related to to this which is how do you you know we're, we're talking about mean reversion strategies and developing these these strategies and, and how to build these models like I, I, how do you think about building these and like what are the what are the structures that you're looking at looking at when you build these and how do you really kind of identify you know like this is a good short selling strategy. This is a good short selling, you know, mechanism, automation, system, discipline. Oh, all right. So, how do you, you know, how do you take your fifty years of experience, your your so many years of experience? I I kind of exaggerated right there, and put it into like a three three second segment for us. All right. Okay. Three second. Okay. So that's a good question. So first of all, I mean the. the um, uh, developing strategies is one of the very few disciplines where infanticide is a healthy discipline. Kill, so, killing children early is a good exactly. is a good discipline. All right, okay. I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping you're referring to the ideas, not not the children. Oh, no 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 no. You know, like I have a funny story. Like I don't eat children anymore. My doctor said it's really bad for my cholesterol. <laughs> it's really bad for my cholesterol. So okay, okay, good. <laughs> Good, good. <laughs> when I, it's funny because I have a story where once I told a, a lady at, the, at school, like, oh, what do, you, she, what do you do for a living? I'm a short seller. She instinctively pulled her kid, like, closer to her, like, no, lady, I don't eat children anymore. My doctor says it's really bad for my cholesterol. She's like, what? I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the idea about this, first of all, I mean, um, you need to decide whether you're going to be a trend following or mean reversion. There's actually a crossover. The strategy that I trade is a crossover, but because it's a scale out, this is one of the very few things. But uh, few, um, as a short seller, I've, these, I've, re uh, I've realized that actually scale out is a good idea, but this is an entirely different conversation. So the, the building blocks of a, of a strategy sp split it in two. I mean, most people, they think, oh, they only think about entry, 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 right? Like, what is a better mousetrap? What is a better mousetrap? But then when you start to get better at it, you realize actually managing the entry, getting something in is one thing, but then knowing how to behave, I mean, controlling the behavior of the stock with once it hits your portfolio is more important. And I strongly believe that actually, letting uh, stocks go into stop loss over and over and over is a very inefficient way to do it. It's a very costly way to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. typically you don't want to have your airbag blow in your car every time you hit a traffic light. Right. right. So that would, you, that would be painful. That would be painful. It, that would it, be high. accessible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, if, if that happened, everybody would be on the train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> so, that just sounds unfortunate like who wants exactly. to get in the face that many times so the idea is to manage positions once they hit um once once they in the portfolio so rather than concentrate on entry all the time i would rather concentrate on two things on exit and on position sizing position sizing uh let, let me give you a very simple analogy uh, position sizing is highly unsexy 
it's uh, it's a very overlooked discipline, but this is where the money is is being made. So if you tr like, you know, if you drove a car all the time in first gear, and if you decided to take a, a beautiful lady on a date, like typically it would be very it would be difficult going uphill first gear, going downhill first gear. Very unlikely that you're going to pass down your genes to the next generation. You need to have a very smooth transition, right? So when things are working, it's you always got to be smooth. It's always exactly. got to be smooth. Exactly, my man, my man. <laughs> <laughs> you got some game here. <laughs> yeah, always, always. Oh man, Miami, you got some game. Uh, <laughs> so. So it's uh, got to be a smooth transition with position sizing, like scale, correct. scaling in, scaling out. Correct. But it's also like the, the, the value of the risk that you trade. What uh, Van Tharp defines as R, the, the nominal value of the risk. So when the equity, when, you, when your strategy works, you should naturally risk more. When your strategy doesn't work, you should trim the sale and risk less. So that's the second part, the money management module. This is something that a lot of market participants forget. But when you're a short seller, remember that actually nine times out of 10, a, a buy on, I mean, a stock going down is a buy on weakness for the vast majority of the other people. So this basically tells you that, uh oh, it, everything starts to work. Maybe I should trim down the risk. So that's the money management. That's a separate module. Now, how right. I, I do start is actually, I'm, I, make, I, um, I make entry fairly easy, but I make staying in the portfolio very difficult. Stocks have to earn their keep. And this is a, this is a trait that I've observed, particularly with fundamental people. Like as soon as it, they make it extremely hard for stocks to get in, it has to, there's a long, long list of criteria, but then once it's in there, man, the cost, the, the, the friction, the inefficiency of keeping in there. <sighs> all right, all right, I'll, I'll come back to it tomorrow. Whereas if you are very disciplined about the stocks that you keep in your portfolio and make it difficult for them to stay, typically like oh, having a trading stop loss, managing the position size, so that actually the ones that in there contribute this tends to pay its dividend over time. So the one thing that I would that I always look out for in a, when I develop strategies, I start with the exit in mind first, and then everything from there is a scaling uh, is a scaling probability. So first is like the fixed stop loss, then trailing stop loss if need be, or the reset of the stop loss. So this is the first building block that I use, and then after that I can focus on the on the entry. Does it make any sense? No, that makes it, it makes a lot of sense in terms of like I, again, I'm just kind of framing this in terms of how I build my mental models around my strategies, which is th think about the result that you're getting, uh, and the result that you want to achieve from the strategy that you're trying to implement. And you know, I also think about this in terms of in terms of the trades that I take. Do I want my strategy to execute once every month, but be have a significantly higher uh, success ratio, or do I want to make lots of lots of little uh, lots of little trades? And I'm thinking about this in the context of how I'm managing my money and then how I'm managing my risk because the the I'm willing if my success ratio is significantly higher with the trades that makes one, makes one trade a month to risk put more risk on the table with my asset allocation versus when I'm when my strategies are executing every few minutes in the opening hours of the bell uh, and, and I need significantly tighter stop losses because I need my probabilities to manage my risk. And again, it's 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 all coming, it's all coming back to you know the discipline that you employ, the the system that you're actually looking for, and then what's the result that you're trying to achieve. Correct. Absolutely. Really. It makes a ton of sense. So yeah, it's interesting. We come to the same conclusion from the, from uh, from climbing the mountain from di different angles. T it's, it totally. I I mean, in in the way that you're the way that you're framing, like the the algorithmic part is the way that you know. In in my experience, I'm looking at it from us. Like I'm I studied chemistry 
uh, in school and, and studied biology, right? Like my interest in the market was born out of, you know, the movie Wall Street, where I'm looking at these guys going to multi-million dollar parties and being like, hey, they're doing something right. Uh, yeah, the, you know, hundred trillion dollar note. How do I get some of those? Um, you'll get there, you'll get there. And, just a matter of time. Like, <laughs> yeah, seriously, it's, it's just a matter of time. Um, I, I, I can only hope, but it's, you know, I'm looking at this and saying like, okay, how do I apply these systems into strategies or, or, you know, limiting reagents or maximizing potential returns with the, with the smallest amount of risk possible. And it's just, it's so interesting how, uh, you can do it both on the long side and the short side, but the short side, at least in, in my my experience thus far has been like poo-pooed where whereas comparatively it should be embraced significantly more because the, the bear market's always around the corner and here we are today you know june 14th and uh it's it's not looking pretty uh, it's looking very juicy i beg to oh, differ. You, you're, you know what you're totally <laughs> right after today's discussion you are totally right you are totally right um Laurent, we're, we're, we're just about out of time. I, I can't thank you enough for the discussion. Um, I would actually love to propose that we have another session where we take some of uh, what you're doing and apply it on the platform and how we actually you know, go through how to build these systems, if you'd be interested. Oh, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. Let's yeah. do it. I, uh, I can't thank you enough for the session today, the time that you spent with me. Uh, really, really interesting. You know what? You know, actually, it's interesting that you mentioned, like, uh, speaking about after today or after the few amber zone, the amber patch that we've reached. The amber patch. Uh, the amber patch, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, the other day I had a, I had dinner with a bunch of friends in, uh, in Marunouchi, a bunch of H1 uh, friends from all time. And uh, about the book, I told them, like, oh, they were like, oh, where should I buy your book? Like, and no, 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 gentlemen, 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 you got it wrong. It's not whether you should buy the book. It's whether you can afford not to read it. <laughs> and, and literally, uh, these guys, like, they pull out their phone, like, all right, Amazon, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and uh, you, know, you know, again, your book uh, is available on Amazon. Uh, algorithmic short selling with Python. Laurent Pernod, thank you again so much. Appreciate the time. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun. Let's do it again. If you, if you, uh, I mean, if you want me back, let's do it again. I would love to, uh, I would love to be there. It's been fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm really, really it's, grateful. 